podcast. It's brought to you in association with our sponsor, Eden Mill. And I have to just tell you that although they, they do produce some wonderful products, we are recording this at 10 o'clock in the morning, so we're not actually enjoying ourselves with any of Eden Mill's products. We're going to leave that till later on. Uh, Celtic View Pod today is with myself, Paul Cadehy, and my Celtic View colleague, Joe Donnelly. We're delighted to be joined in this podcast by our under 18 coach, former Celtic player, Hello, D. Darren, thanks for joining us. Not a problem. Obviously, strange circumstances. Uh, you know, we, we did this podcast last week remotely when we all chatted, and obviously, modern technologies bring us together. How are you dealing with obviously the situation now that everybody's effectively just on, on lockdown? I'm dealing with it absolutely fine. I think social media now gives you an insight into the whole world, and there's there's people that are really struggling either with their health, financially, all different reasons, and and I'm. Blessed, I've got my family under one roof. We're all healthy um, and happy, and I think put, puts perspective on on life really when uh, something like this happens. So, no, I'm absolutely fine. I think the people kind of having a joke and laugh, complain about having to school, school or homeschool their kids and stuff. I, I'm quite enjoying it. I spent a lot of my career away from my kids and uh, in different countries, so I'm enjoying spending time with them and the family. So it's uh, it's obviously ideally you'd be working, and I miss the work, but uh, when you when you put it into perspective, um, we couldn't be any better off, really. Yeah, because I was wondering this, uh, the challenges, obviously, as a coach, because you're so used to being out and out on the training pitch working with the guys, and, and I suppose that's a different challenge already in your coaching career of having to coach the, your players remotely and make sure that they're staying fit and they're still working on things that they can. Yeah, it is. Yeah, so we're really lucky. Technology these days, we can we can interact a lot with them. We've obviously got WhatsApp group chats, um, and they've been sent out individual programs. They've been sent out nutritional programs, psychology programs. We've got daily kind of tasks for them and challenges ranging from physical ones to posting up their breakfasts and, and we've put up recipes that they've had to make get food and it just to keep them all interacting with each other and ourselves um, so no it, it, it's if you had had this 10 15 years ago you'd probably have found it a lot more difficult um, at the minute we can still interact with the players and it's just finding unique ways to, to keep them motivated and, and taking over really and, and hopefully we'll be back uh, together sooner rather than later yeah because the guys that you're coaching it's such a I, mean, I suppose every stage of your career is important, but particularly at the age they are, it's such a, a key moment in the what they hope to progress in their Celtic careers. Yeah, it is, and and they probably haven't developed the habits and the the kind of culture that the first team players have. That you could probably trust first team players to just go away and look after themselves. Although I I know I know. Um, speaking to people that the first team players have, have been sent stringent programmes as well but younger players haven't developed habits so it is important you kind of stay on top of them a little bit and um, and it's important you stay interacting with them so we're in we're in daily contact with them all and, and likewise they are with each other um, so yeah you're right it's, it's an important very important part of the career uh, and and kind of my main concern with them is and they haven't developed the, the habits of a first team footballer yet so it's just keeping on top of them a little bit I suppose yeah. they must like on the, the mental side of it must be really important as well Darren and you know yourself coming through the ranks at Celtic how much um, you know unity comes with being part of a team going to train and mixing with the lads and I know social media brings everybody together but I mean that must be from a mental perspective obviously there's the physical drawbacks because people can't train together but Mentally, they can maintain that connectedness on a, on a certain level, whilst it's not as good as in person, they are able to you know, communicate all the time together. Yeah, ab- absolutely. Um, from a mental point of view, it is, it is very big. Uh, and as you say, they're not together in person, but you kind of, I feel like I've, uh, I have been with them because you're constantly in, to- in dialogue with them, whether it's over the phone or... Um, as I said, the group chats, and then they upload videos daily of different tasks they've been given, and so you're constantly seeing them, and, and they're seeing you, and um, and you're interacting with them. So, it, as I said, if this if this had have occurred 10, 15 years ago, before kind of the technology was in, it would have been a lot lot harder. But you still feel very much um, part of the group, and and that's that's important um, from a mental point as well. I mean, how have you, in terms of your own coaching career, you're still really at the start of, of that, and. Was it always something that you were you were looking to do, and how much have you enjoyed obviously being back at the club where it all began for you? Well, the first part of it, yeah, probably was always I was always really really interested in in this side of the game, um, 
I never, I never at a young age earmarked myself to be a coach and then or a manager or whatever. But if I look back, my career was something that probably the way I played the game was. I had to use my my brain a lot of the time because physical attributes. I wasn't I wasn't light and quick or strong or or big. Um, I had to use my head and to play at the level I did. Uh, I would have liked to think that was probably one of my main strengths was how I read the game. And I am, um, but no, probably it was probably came about about four years ago, three years ago maybe. I rang, funnily enough, I rang Scott Brown and. I, I was coming to a point in my career where I was—I could feel my body slowing up a little bit, um, and I was picking up niggly injuries that I didn't normally pick up throughout my career. And I was very robust as a player; that I would always be able to play, play and train at a really high level all the time. And um, I spoke to Scott Brown because I, I remember him I was trying to think maybe three, four years ago that he kind yeah, of had a season yeah. where he, it was a little bit of a broken season for him, and he had a bit of pressure on top of him, but he. To say he's come through that with flying colours is an understatement. Um, and we, we had a conversation for half an hour. And we kind of talked. He's a, he's a friend of mine anyway. And I I took his advice and what I knew what I wanted to do was to push through it and to train harder than I've ever trained. And that's what he he's he said he did. Um, but <laughs> my, my body didn't cope with it as well as he <laughs> has. Um, so... Basically, I couldn't get I couldn't get to the level I wanted to be at. And listen, I, I definitely believe I could have prolonged my career by uh, maybe two, three, four years and and played at the, the certainly in the Premier League in Scotland. But I wasn't I wasn't interested in that. And um, during the time I was with Dundee, I'd uh, I'd done my coaching badges. I'd done a lot of coaching as well. And when the opportunity came up uh, at the end of the season, my contract was up. I was in talks with other clubs. It, it kind of just came over me, why wouldn't I look to the other side and see if there's anything out there? And when the opportunity arose to go into coaching, I had opportunity to play or coach. I was so, so much more excited and motivated by taking an opportunity to coach. So it led me into the, uh, eventually, obviously, into the Celtic role. And it's been, uh, it's been absolutely fantastic. I remember yeah. talking to Johnny Hayes at, at one point, Dan, and he was saying kind of almost exactly what you were saying there for the kind of long stretch of his career when he was younger. Coaching wasn't something in his mind, you know. In fact, for him, I think he was saying, you know, it was almost certainly wasn't going to do it. And then as he started to get a wee bit nearer 30 and he started to give it a bit more thought, he realised quickly that it was something that he would be interested in doing. Of course, he was doing his badges um, this season, but on the other side of, of the new year, and as he's moving kind of deeper into his 30s, he can see it as somewhere which he will see himself moving forward. And I mean, it sounds kind of very similar to yourself, that it was a gradual thing that you eventually realise, yes, yeah, is for me. Yeah, well, obviously, John, me and Johnny grew up together in Dublin, yeah. played against each other since we were 10 years old. Um, so we've kind of, <clears throat> we're um, off, obviously known really well through the international ages and all that. And I've spoken to him actually recently about his badges and um, hopefully he goes on after, he hopefully he plays for another number of years, but he goes on and, and has a career in coaching. But no, I, I for me, it was, um, it was a case of, when I went to Dundee and I started coaching the the under 18s and reserve team, I remember I used anyone that knew me as a player. I loved training. I loved the competitive side. Too. I loved, I loved actually hurting a little bit. I loved running. I loved, I loved every part of of being a footballer. And I loved the hard parts of being in it. Where when I was going in at Dundee, there was times I was going in to train, which would be the highlight of my day. And I was looking forward to the evening because I knew I was going out to coach. And I was actually more looking forward to going out and coach a session rather than being part of it, which was anyone that knows me is is absolutely alien. That That is mm-hmm. the last thing I, lo- I loved. I loved training. Where So I, it started to... It Probably the hardest part I had was admitting to myself I wanted to stop. And I remember saying to my wife, I spoke to my wife one day and just kind of came out with it. And she kind of looked at me because, strangely, to say least, because she didn't, there was no, there'd never been a conversation about it. But it was kind of the, the September or October last year. And I said, look, I, I, I want to stop. And a lot left to me. So it was a little bit strange because until they can't, the majority of footballers will will play till they can't go anymore. They'll play till they drop. And if um, that was probably the hardest part for me was admitting it. But once I'd admitted it, it became so obvious that that was the right thing to do. And, and now that I'm, Kind of eight months, nine months into my into my coaching career, um, I look back and think that there's not one day goes by and I think I've I've made the wrong decision. Because I also wonder as well, you know, when you look at the likes of yourself and Steve McManus, who are coaching hopefully the, the Celtic players of the future, does that help as well over, over and above the, the experience you can pass on? The fact that they can look at you and you can 
you know, talk the talk, you walk the walk, you've been there, you've done it, and you've got to the highest level. So it's, it's a good example for them to say, right, you know, I'm getting coached, getting coached by a former academy player who became a first-team Celtic player. Yeah, I, I'd be lying if I said it didn't It didn't help and it wasn't a, a fantastic experience to be able to to relay over to the players. But in all honesty, it's it's a very small part of it. You have to... You have to go and prove yourself as a, as a mm. top coach and a good coach, and they have to be able to trust what you're saying. Um, and I'll get judged on on my on the work I do as a coach, not what I did as a player. Um, yeah. It would be very easy for me to go in and say, "Well, I did this and I did that." Um, it, it, it really, and, and to be honest with you, the majority of players that I'm coaching are 60, 17 year old. I played at Celtic. I think last time I think it was 2010, maybe. So you're talking 10 years ago. These boys would have been six years old. They wouldn't. They don't remember me, and certainly I wasn't a big enough name that they would, they would remember anyway. Um, so they don't look at me and and think, oh, he's an ex Celtic player. We got to listen to him. They judge me as a coach and, and as a person. So, um, obviously the experiences I've had help um help me, um to form my ideas of of what it takes and and what they need. But in all honesty, I get judged as a coach, so it's it's imperative I develop and progress and. Um, and that's that's what I try to do day to day is get better and better and, and likewise that I kind of I always think I'm a mirror of the players I'm looking to develop and, and progress through through uh, the ages as well Yeah well I mean one of the reasons obviously it, we wanted to get you on to just have a chat about your, your work now but today's also the 10th anniversary of the very first game Neil Lennon took charge as manager having taken over from Tony Mowbray we played Kilmarnock in the 27th of March 2010 I'm just going to uh, slightly unfair. I'm going to do a quick quiz on you. Right. You played. You played in that game. Can you? How many of that that start in the living? Can you? Can you remember? Um, well, I know Robbie Keane obviously played because he scored. Um, yeah. Bruni played because he scored late on. Uh, or later on in the game, I think he scored the third. Did he? Um, That's right. Yeah. 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 Oh. I could give it. I could have a guess. Did the did the boy? Do you remember the boy Josh Thompson? Did he play centre back with me? Maybe? Yeah, yeah, he was. Yeah, he played. Yeah, Jeez, that's a centre back pairing that Celtic should never see again. Um, I'll go. Aiden would have played. Would he, McGee? Yeah, yeah, uh, he played. Goalkeeper. Goalkeeper. Was it? Was it uh, the Polish boy? Not obviously Boric. Was it, no, it was, uh, was, was Arthur. Yeah, was it Boric? Yeah, was yeah, Arthur? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, was Nail still there? Lee Naylor? Was he still yeah, there? Yeah, he played as well, yeah. Uh, you're, on a, you're on a roll now. I know. There's ones that I'm hoping weren't playing. <laughs> they're, they're names that haunt me forever. Uh, Nguemo, was he playing? He was, yeah. Aye, that's one. <laughs> um, right back, Hinkle. Hinkle, no? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so you'd have McGeady then left, Bruni and Guemo and was just got Fortune. Two. Fortune. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So you've just got one more forward. Uh, I'll have a bash Cam- Cam- Camara, was it? Oh no. no. Samaras. 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 That was impressive, that is. That was impressive. <laughs> yeah, no, I impressed myself there. What we're gonna do now is we'll just we're gonna just take a, a quick pause and we're gonna listen back to the goals, two from Robbie Keane and one from Scott Brown from the 27th of March, 2010. Gwemo spins round, one player gives it to Samaras. Samaras back to Hinkle. Hinkle takes a touch. Across now to Brown. Brown in the centre circle. Plays it across to Naylor. Good ball. Naylor has been tracked back by Russell. Still Naylor, he's on his right foot. Chips it across into the box, but it's Simon Ford. Heads it clear. Chested down by Nguemo. Nguemo, five yard pass to the left. Brown, Brown forward to Robbie Keane in the edge of the box. Simon Ford. Couldn't pick past him. Robbie Keane. He chips it in. Yeah. And that is a wonder goal. He danced past Ford. He danced past Severin. And chipped it over Bell. And it's 1 0 to Celtic. And Robbie Keane has given Celtic the lead. Yeah, that's just a great individual effort by Robbie Keane. I mean, he just got the ball. <coughs> Excuse me, just at the edge of the box and then just beat two commander players and also the goalkeeper. A wonderful individual effort. Nothing to do with team play or anything else at all. Just a, a striker at the top of his powers, just taking advantage of a chance he's been given. And, uh, you know, nobody else in our team could have done that, to be quite honest. And very, very few players could do that. Excellent. Well, I think 
Jim summed it up perfectly. I don't think anyone else in the team could have done that. He sp spun past four, they nutmeg seven, and he chipped it over Bell. And I think there was an inquest in the command defence. I think there was nothing they could have done. I think it was just, as Jim said, a man at the height of his powers. And he's given with ten minutes to the first half to go. Neil Lennon Celtic, a one goal lead. Scott Brown plays it forward to Robbie Keane, who's on the right hand side. He brings it down. Good play there from the Irishman. Bears down in Severin. Still, Robbie Keane drops his shoulder and he plays it into the back of the net. It's 2 0 to Celtic, and we have to say thank goodness for Robbie Keane. Yeah, just two goals that, you know, a top talent has scored for us. It's by no means been a convincing display from the outfield players at all in terms of moving the ball around a wee bit, but that's twice Robbie Keane has just got the ball in the, an ideal position to show what he's capable of. And let's hope we keep him again next season. Well, he just one on one with seven, he dropped his shoulder twice and then just went inside and just blasted the ball across to the far post. Wonderful technique, and there's nothing much Kamarnock can do. They, they, they'll be quite disappointed. I think their management team were disappointed with the corners and free kicks and stuff like that. They haven't really had a great deal of good ball into the box. Well, they'll be looking for a better ball from the captain this time, Craig Bryson. Just flights it across, it's missed by everyone and eventually spins over on the far side and it's picked up by Fortune. He's got Keane ahead of him. He knocks it there and Keane gets in front of Kelly. Good play there from Keane. He's got Brown inside. Gives it to Brown. Brown drives forward. Fortune is wide on the right. Plays it to McGeady. McGeady on the left hand side. It's McGeady against Clancy. McGeady takes a shot and it's Brown who's scored. And it's 3 0 to Celtic and the captain has made the point secure. And that is a move that started in Celtic's penalty area and finished. In the back of the Kilmarnock net, it's Celtic 3, Kilmarnock now. Yeah, that was a bit better, you know, they made good use of the ball and uh, Scott Brown through the middle, out to Aidan McGeady and then did the right thing, come back into the middle again and uh, the ball let well laid off by Aidan McGeady into his path. Complaints from Kilmarnock that Brown might have been offside, but probably not. Darren, obviously you were in that, that first Celtic team, Neil Lennon took over after the, the, the defeat at, at St Mon Park and what was he like? Because obviously he came from the, the reserves and you know you were talking earlier on about it didn't matter what you did before, you had to prove yourself as a coach. What was, what was he like coming into that squad at the time and trying to settle everybody? Yeah, it was obviously a really, it was actually a horrible time to be honest with you. Is there's there's not a moment in my Celtic career I, I wish I didn't have but that was a really bad, bad time. Uh, obviously, we'd come off the back of that horrific defeat. We'd pretty much, well, we had, we'd conceded the league because we'd, we'd lost at Ibrox. Uh, I think it was four games previously. Um, but no, he was great. He came in and, and he, he let us know straight away he wanted the job. He was auditioning for the job. And, um, and I actually think, I suppose, from his point of view, it was maybe a selfish point of view that he was looking to get his own out of it, but we actually needed that. We needed a purpose, and we obviously couldn't win the league. We we the cup, obviously, which ended up a catastrophe, but that was the only kind of cup we were obviously still uh, competing for. Um, but in the league, it was he, he kind of galvanised us to be honest. Because I think we won the last eight games. That I think yeah, that's right. Yeah. And I, so yeah. that, I have to say, like, listen, the players go out and play. But that that was probably he had a huge part to play in that because. We as a squad were, to say downbeat is an understatement. We um, we obviously were coming into the splits. So you're coming into the toughest games of the season, and and to go and win eight games in a row, considering the position we were in and the the position in terms of the uh, the feeling in the squad was was testament to him. And um, now he, he he obviously he's obviously done fantastically well and, and went on to take the job. And obviously the rest is history. Yeah, it's remarkable. I think it's almost like history repeating itself when he came back in again last season and. Like steadies the ship, wins the treble. Yeah, I think, uh, listen, he's got loads of strengths as a manager that, that everyone will, will know and have opinion on. But I do feel like one of his his, his biggest strengths is he just has a, f a fantastic feel of what's needed. Um, so when he when he came in uh, the first time, when obviously I was there as a player, he talked about the, I think his his kind of iconic phrase of bringing the thunder back, and he understood what was needed at that time. And I, mean, I, I believe he could tell you more depth of, of exactly what he was wanting to do, but he wanted to bring more Celtic-minded people into the club that understood what it took to be a Celtic player that could handle the 
the day to day pressures of it and and essentially bring bring back success. Um, and, and now and, and when he came back in after Brendan Rodgers left, it was very much of, of steadying the ship and and being patient. Um, because himself and Brendan Rodgers are two fantastic managers in their own right, but they're very different. Um, and I feel like the manager from afar. Obviously, I was watching last year just kept things consistent, kept things steady. And, and now you've seen this season him putting his own imprint on the team. And and um, I think that takes a lot a lot of um, maturity and, and uh, understanding to know that last year when he came in, it wasn't a case of of changing everything there and then. He, he, he was patient with it and delivered the success the club the club needed and, and then now has, has changed it into his own team and now what you see is very much a Neil Lennon team so um, no, all credit to him he's he's done fantastically well in both spells yeah. One of the things I love about Neil Lennon and I'm obviously not the first person to say this but is his willingness and his belief in young players to come in basically if you're good enough you can play in, in his starting 11 he of course gave James Forrest his debut uh, back in 2010 not too long after his first game in charge of Paul was speaking about before for. He showed a lot of faith in Jeremy Frimpong this season, for example. And Dan is somebody that's, you know, looking after the young guys at Celtic. I mean, do you carry that as well? That you know, if these guys are good enough, then they've got every chance of making it at the highest level. Yeah, that right at the minute in my career, that is like my sole goal is to create first team players. That I, there's no league or cup I'll win as a youth coach that will give me more satisfaction than developing a first team player that's all I want and that's my whole focus is is how do we get as many as we can in now the club is a a, a, a rich history of, of successes coming through um, and been either sold on for fantastic money or gone on to be club legends and or, or both um, and been very successful I my my sole goal is to to make that even more efficient and um, been part of it sorry of part of a very very strong and, and fantastic team of, of coaches and and staff um, but to be part of creating first team players I'm not interested in uh, winning winning things at this level I'm interested in creating first team players and um, you're right we've got we've got a, a club I think we've got a club a league um, and certainly a manager that will back that. And I think you look at the players that have come in that throughout the years, they've always had, and this is something I'm actually, funnily enough, doing a, a kind of study on, is they've, they've similar traits. Um, they're different types of players, different positions, completely different shapes, sizes, but there's similar traits in there that, that I'm studying. And, and I think that's important. You relay that over to the younger players because <clears throat> it's no coincidence that the, the ones that do break through have similar characteristics. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's funny we've, when we've done interviews with various coaches the academy over the years and it's it kind of just touching what you said when they sit in the stand at Celtic Park and they see a player that they've coached coming out on the pitch as a first team player that sense of pride is something that they just it, it, it makes it all worth all the work that's done through the old age groups and then the finished product or, or at the start of that hopefully that Celtic journey gives you that you know, purpose for getting out every day in the training field and working hard with these young guys. Yeah, and, and ultimately it comes down to them. You, you're only going to be a very small part of it. Um, but yeah, that, that's absolutely where, that's success. So if someone says to me, how do I measure if we're doing doing well or not, or what's success or what's not? That's important, we understand that. And to me, success, there's only one success, and that's getting first team players developed in a true, true our academy and into the first team. Um, so obviously our job is to cre- is to essentially create reserve team players, if that makes sense, to push them on as, as quickly as we can into the reserves, and, and then they take the next step into the into the first team. But um, yeah, I absolutely, obviously, I'm I'm in the I've been in I think it's just over six months now. I'm hoping in the next eighteen months, two years, I'm I'm watching these games and and you're seeing boys come through and and to me that'll that'll far away any game you win at U team level or any cup or league or, or whatever maybe. Yeah, because it's kind of like, it's similar to being seeing when you're a supporter. I always think there's that see the boys that come through the academy because you you kind of if they weren't playing they'd be sitting beside you in the stand cheering the team on and I think there's just something. It's why everybody loves Callum McGregor and James Forrest and Kieran Tierney when he was here as well because they're they're just they're supporters as well. Yeah, listen, listen, don't don't get me wrong. I, I think I was cut a lot of slack at times as a player at Celtic because because you say you're one of your own, and I was treated 
phenomenally well by the support and I still share a fantastic relationship with them. Um, but I think when you look at them three players, and I'm talking about having similar characteristics, they're all different types, technically different um, different sizes. But one thing they have is a, is a is an appreciation, and and they don't tell you that they're not in the pre- papers every day playing to the fans, saying how, how much they support Celtic and how much they love Celtic. They show it in how they they apply themselves every time they play. I remember watching Kieran Tierney when he first came into the team, and and he he played his first game at Celtic as as, as in his debut the same way he played his last. He just looked like he was desperate. He, he had a desperation to be a success. And Callum McGregor, he, the, the, Callum McGregor plays probably on average 50, 60 games a year and you never see him have it. Uh, there's not one moment in a game I watch Callum McGregor and think he's not given everything he possibly can. Now, Callum McGregor is a phenomenal footballer, technically yeah. phenomenal, mm. tactically, physically, everything. So all of that side of it is looked at, but his actual mentality to the game and his his commitment to it is, is second to none. And, that, and that's what I'm talking about. All these boys have the same characteristics. They're, they have different styles um, and they have different ways of getting there in terms of their, their talent. But their their desire to actually be footballers and top elite footballers is is what's outstanding. Um, Kieran Tierney was wasn't the outstanding talent coming through the academy when he was there, um, but he's certainly one of the most talented footballers I've seen come through um, when he when he became a first team player. So it's um, it's just aspiring to create more of them, and uh, the more we can create, the better it'll be for the club, the academy, for everyone. And and as I said, that's where that's where all my my uh, desire and passion is at. Yeah. Now, obviously, we get you on. We can't not talk about that day in March 2009. That I'm guessing that must be as a player when that when you headed that ball into the back of the net at Hamden. I mean, I can't even begin to imagine how that must have felt. I know what it felt as a supporter, but to to be a goal scorer, it must have just been incredible. Yeah, I think I think now, say now, and in the last number of years, I, I've obviously really appreciated this because because you're still talking about it and it just shows you the the scale of the club and the size of the club that winning cups and leagues to be a part of people talk of the history and that's a, an absolute tiny part of it but just to be part of the history and that was something Gordon Strachan used to drill into us all the time was every league and cup you won you were part of the history of an absolutely iconic club around the world and that's that's again talk about success as a footballer you can earn money and, and material things that to me is the where you take pride in um, so yeah it was fantastic I'll be honest see at the time I scored I genuinely had three things on my mind one I was exhausted um, in the game because it was extra time and yeah. I was absolutely piped and the pitch at Hamden was so heavy the second thing was actually genuinely a member coming across my mind that I was going to I was going to keep my place for the following week. That's all I, I wanted to do was, <laughs> was play. We played Dundee United. I, I remember the game against Dundee United the following week. I think we drew two, two each up at Tannadice and I'm sure Lee Naylor scored. But I, I remembered that thinking, I'm going to hang on to my place now. He can't leave me out. Um, and that was really important to me. Um, and the third thing was the night out. I was obviously looking out. To <laughs> so, um, no, it's now you appreciate the scale of, of being involved and winning things in Cups. But I'll be honest, see, when I was in the first team, I appreciated every moment I had. But it was the norm. Winning a cup was the norm. Um, you woke up the next day, you had your 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 wee night out, and then it was right. We needed to win the league, and if you ever won the league, it was you had the probably a cup final a week, two weeks later, whatever it may be. So it was the norm. You never sat back after winning a league and thought that's magnificent. And blah. you just thought, right, where's the next one coming from? And it's probably and when you leave Celtic, you you realise there's there's only a handful of clubs in world football in each league that, that win leagues and cups and Celtic is obviously at the forefront of that every year so it, it kind of you really see from, when when you leave Celtic you really see how special the club is in terms of of giving you the opportunity to be constantly uh, fighting for silverware. Yeah, I've got a bony pick with you, Dan. Uh, in respect, <laughs> in respect to that goal, um, I, I, speaking purely as a fan, given that you scored what a minute, two minutes into extra time that day, I was sitting with my dad at Hamden, nerves shredded, given that it's against Rangers, it's the cup final. 
and then for you to score so so quickly into extra time, how could you not have scored in the 88th minute, 89th <laughs> minute and just calm the nerves? Although, to be fair, it did calm the nerves for the rest of the extra time, but uh, I thought as soon as I heard Darnody was coming on the podcast, I have to bring that up. I can tell you now, there was no one more gutted that there was extra time than me. <laughs> so if I could have scored in the 88 minute and leave me, I would have. I was, I actually, at the end of the game, we were... I was on the, because obviously you don't go into the dressing rooms, you're on the pitch. Yeah. And the physio came on and I was cramping up. I'd been cramping up probably since the 70th minute because I hadn't played as much football as the others. Obviously, probably the, the kind of adrenaline of the occasion had kicked in as well. I was physically fit, but uh, I was cramping up and I was on the ground getting stretched out by the physio and Gordon Strachan was roaring at me um, saying, get on your feet because he didn't want them to see us fatigued. Yeah. And we were fit at the time. <laughs> And, uh, and basically, I was saying, I'm, I'm just cramping up. And he was saying, do you want to come off? Do you want to come off? And in my head, I was thinking, yeah, because I'm, <laughs> because I was gubbed. But I thought I, I would never have said yes. So I ended up staying. I came off at a half time and extra time. I don't know how it lasted that, that long. So best uh, bluff I've ever called is to, to say I'll stay on the pitch. So believe me, if I could have finished it before full time, I'd have done it. It's also good that day, I'm guessing, it's like so you and Aidan have come through the ranks together. The both of you get the goals to, to win the cup that day, and, and obviously it's against Rangers. That must have been nice, given the fact you've got all those memories of coming through the ranks. Yeah, obviously me and Aidan were were roommates both with Celtic, but then also on the national team as well, and we were mm-hmm. best of pals, and our families are are very close now as well. So, no, it's fantastic. Um, we, we'd have shared the occasion anyway together, but then to, to be the two goal scorers was was obviously excellent and probably the, taught me what was first in my mind after I remember after the game one of the first things in my head was was Tommy Burns would Tommy Burns would have been absolutely you're talking about passion to bring players through to the first team he he would have been as proud as anyone and he was he was someone that was really very much in the forefront of my mind he would have been absolutely delighted with it so yeah it was a brilliant day probably for the the academy and talking about coaches I'd love to one day be, be watching a cup final and seeing two academy graduates uh, scoring the, the goal so uh, all in all it was a fantastic day yeah and as you say when you know when Gordon Strachan says to you everything you do here every every trophy you win it's part of the history but I'm, I'm guessing you must every time somebody meets you a Celtic fan the laws I'm sure they almost must talk about that goal and always remember it and it's it's nice you've kind of you've made your mark on the history of the club yeah, and, and I think that's what's so unique about the club. That, like, with, in all the players that have played for Celtic, I'm near the bottom of it, both in terms of talent and, and affecting the club. But you, that's the kind of the selling point if you're if you're coming to the club is financially, of course, first team players get get rewarded very well, and we, there's so much talk of how much more money there is in England at times and and, and different things. But they, this club blows any club out of the water in terms of the, the opportunity to be a hero. And and for someone is with my ability as a footballer to be able to ten years from uh, ten years on to still be talking about it and and you're right to get it probably mentioned daily to me. That is I would never have got that. My ability they wouldn't have allowed me to play at any other level and I was lucky I worked hard enough and got had the right support to get into the first team through the academy but um, so yeah, it's fantastic and, and something that you're really proud of now. And, and as I said, hopefully I'm going to be part of developing the next the next players that, that can go and do that. Yeah. I also think as well, you, you obviously are very modest. I think you kind of sell yourself short down because I always think you mentioned Tommy Burns. They always said about you know good players don't stay at Celtic. You know, so the fact that you you, you got in the first team and you stayed there, that, that, that you know there was quality there. That's why you were play, that's why you played for us. Ah yeah, no, no. Listen, like I wasn't, I was, I was all right. But I look, I just look at the, 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 the Obviously, I've supported the club. I've supported the club since I've left, and I see the either centre backs or left backs that have played um, since and, and before me. Like it doesn't compare in terms of my ability to them. But um, but one thing, one thing, I, I would back myself all day, and I would, with the very best of any Celtic player, as I had a mentality that that would have matched them, and I had a an application and a desire to play, um, and that carried me a lot. Um, I was willing to go, I was willing to go the extra yard um, at times, and that, and I didn't tell people that at the time. I, I, I showed it the way I worked and the way I trained, and um, the way I got into Gordon Strachan's team was I became the fittest player in the in the in the, in the club. Now, if anyone knew me growing up, I was 
an averagely fit player. I was obviously naturally enough fit because you played football. But if you were doing a run, I was middle to the back of the group. I was a centre-back, a stereotypical centre-back. Tommy Burns told me Gordon Stratton loved fit players, which was now I'd worked with him for five years. It's so true. It's um, it's probably the best piece of advice ever. So I remember going away pre-season uh, the year before I broke in and I just ran. And there was no sports science equipment. There was no heart rate monitors. I ran till I hurt. And then when I was hurting, I ran more. And now that was, I ended up having hernia ops because I was probably overdoing it. But the, the, the reality was I knew how to get there and I, I was willing to, I was willing to hurt and put my body through whatever I had to take to get there. And I'm talking about talent. My talent wouldn't have carried me. And I work with players now that I look at their talent and think, if you match that up with, with the mentality maybe I had, you're going to create players, no doubt, because we've got some fantastically talented players in our academy. And, and I believe my my expertise, along with the other coaches, we've got enough between us to, to tactically, technically, and all the different aspects of the game, develop them. But if the, the mentality side of it is the one that we're not fully control, in control of, but that's probably going to be the biggest difference. Because one thing's for sure, Celtics Academy will see millions and millions of talented boys come through. It's up to us to, to find a way of making that talent count and, and ultimately how it counts is getting into the first team. Yeah. Listen, Darren, we are just about come to the end of the podcast. Um, so really appreciate your time. Um, we, could, we could have sat and talked all day, but... Uh, I'm sure your family will be wanting some more homeschooling. Yeah, yeah. No, I have to do a bit of homework now, I think. <laughs> well, listen, we, we can't leave you without... Uh, we're going to finish this podcast with the commentary from that day in March 2009, that that goal that uh, put us on the, the road to winning the League Cup. Uh, thanks again and, and listen, all, all the best for your future career uh, as a coach and, and I'm sure in the full as a time of manager as well. Brilliant, guys. Thanks very much. Thanks, Don. Cheers, Don. So we across there. the halfway line, that's for McGiddy to chase McGiddy up against Broadfoot McGiddy's got the pace, Peter McGiddy to win it for Celtic, that's a penalty and Kurt Broadfoot could well be off Celtic have the penalty won by Eden McGiddy and Kurt Broadfoot stands up and Kurt Broadfoot is gone well Eden McGiddy stepped inside the clip on the back of the leg and a very easy decision for referee to go down Eden McGiddy was in Gordon Strachan's bad books. He's now got the chance to make every Celtic fan roar. Celtic will win the Corporate of Insurance Cup for 2009. Signed, sealed and delivered by Eddie McGinney. The good penalty, the great penalty. And Eddie McGinney, the smile. And the trophy, Celtic are the winners of the Cup of Insurance Cup Final 2009.